Looking at the audience here, I think uh, I have either worked with most of you on some of these issues in one capacity or another, or you probably know way more about it than I do. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to do a very brief or a very quick flyover at 30,000 feet of some basic concepts. Uh, there are written materials uh, of the slides that are on the chairs are available, um, and there's a lot of stuff there. I'm going to try to summarize and, and move along since uh, I have been reminded uh, frequently in the last couple of weeks by the other two people up here <coughs> that I have way too much material for my time, and uh, they're correct. So. Uh, we will uh, see how it goes. Being lawyers, you've got to throw in the usual disclaimer. And actually, the reason I put that one in is so that I could tell you what it really means is that as lawyers, on any of these issues, we got friends who are for it and friends who are against it. And we're with our friends. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that. Uh, the examples we have and the things we're talking about are purely works of fiction. Any resemblance to uh, land or uh, lines drawn or people are uh, purely uh, help part of our story and to make it uh, more believable, but they are fiction. So the uh, first question that comes up anytime you're talking about title to uh, uh, body of water, uh, river, stream, lake, and here I'll use the uh, thing you put in a contract that says if I say river, stream, or lake, the, the words uh, include all of the others unless the context clearly means otherwise, so I won't have to try to keep jumping back and forth. The first question is, is this river navigable? Um, why does it matter? Because it tells us who owns it. How is it determined? Uh, by litigation in most cases. Uh, if it was navigable, I, we go back to King George, and uh, he owned the uh, rivers, or I guess it was the French guy for the Louisiana Purchase where we are here, but uh, for the colonies that passed from the king to the colonies, uh, then the states were admitted on equal footing, that's the Enabling Act where we uh, were authorized to become a state, uh, and uh, it has been... Uh, so we got, as North Dakota, even though we came in uh, 100 plus years later, we got the same rights in uh, navigable waters as the original colonies. If it's not navigable, the short answer is it's owned by the adjacent owners. Uh, there are the, uh, the owners of the upland adjacent to the water. It's owned um, by them to the center and you draw the lines out uh, from the edge of their property to the center, which is, which is easy uh, if the, the river is nice and straight and uh, the, uh, the lake is perfectly round. It gets a little more complicated when the river twists and turns and the lake looks more like a salamander than a, a basketball. How do we determine navigability? Uh, well, it's as of the, the first issue is it's as of the date of statehood. Uh, we can look at stuff now, and it might be relevant, but it really, when it gets right down to it, um, it's as of the date of statehood. And because of that, the definition is historical also. Um, and the definition of navigability is, is tied to its ability to be, have been used uh, in commerce. And I, I thought about this. If you take the map of North Dakota and basically rotate it, 90 degrees, you have the Yellowstone and the, the Missouri being the equivalent of I-94 and I-29. Uh, I-29, uh, the Yellowstone coming into Montana and joining the Missouri and, and running across. So that's, that, and that's what it was. Those, those were the highways. So, so that's uh, really the test. Um, I had the, the good fortune of being involved uh, as a lawyer, it was a great deal because I was, in a sense, one of the clients on the final trial of the Little Missouri case of the question of whether that river was navigable. So I got to sit in on that, and it was uh, it was uh, interesting. It was really comes down a lot of it was dueling historians. We talked about, or they talked about, uh, a guy who uh, 
was cutting trees for uh, uh, use as railroad ties in uh, southern North Dakota or Montana and floating them up the Little Missouri to Medora to be used to build the uh, Northern Pacific. The only thing is he had some trouble. Uh, they didn't all make it, a lot of them in the shore, so he tried again the next year. Uh, some of them didn't. Uh, ultimately, I guess, based on the, the decision there, you could say that uh, unsuccessful commerce does not equal commerce for navigability purposes. Uh, just a, a couple, these are just some examples. They're not necessarily all of them. Um, this slide could also be entitled, Why I'm Not a Litigator. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the question of the nav nav navigability of the Little Missouri started in 19, or was started by a lawsuit in 1978. The federal government was a party, not as the sovereign, but because the Little Missouri, as you all know, runs a good part of its course through the national grasslands, so either um, as acquired land or original land, the, the federal government was the riparian landowner, and of course they didn't want it to be navigable because then they would own it as a, as a landowner. Um, it uh, went through uh, three uh, decisions by a district court, three appeals to the Eighth Circuit, a U.S. Supreme Court, an opinion, and an amendment uh, of the uh, Federal Quiet Title Act by Congress, and then ultimately, unfortunately, at least in my opinion, um, uh, the state of North Dakota lost. So we know why it's important. The next question is, how do you draw the lines? How do you determine who owns, whether it's, uh, it's navigable or not, how do you determine ownership? Um, and uh, anyone who's done any work in this area is familiar with, with meander lines. Uh, there are lines that would replace what would otherwise be usually a, a 40 acre or a quarter quarter section, sometimes uh, an 80 acre chunk of a section, and uh, are, uh, follow the shoreline of the, uh, the, the navigable, or I take that back, that's a good point. The presence or absence of meander lines does not establish navigability. It just means that it was big enough, deep enough, or I'm not sure exactly what, that they meandered it rather than simply uh, surveying right over the top of it. So anyway, the, the real boundary then is these, these lines are meant to uh, represent the edge of the water. They are not the boundary line, the real boundary is um, the shoreline, and if the shoreline moves, so does the boundary. Um, that's also important for another reason, and that is because if you say in a deed or a lease, lots one through four of section six, uh, 153, 102, and lots one through four are riparian to the Missouri, or adjacent to the Missouri, you're saying not lot one as 22.37 acres in the GLO survey or the original survey, et cetera, you're saying lot one up to the edge of the Missouri, how, wherever it exists today. And um, so sometimes you see plus secretions, uh, relictions, my favorite is derelictions, uh, but <laughs> that actually is a word in this context. I didn't think it would be. But anyway, those words really are unnecessary. Uh, because unless the um, deed or the lease says specifically and clearly otherwise, simply saying lot one through four includes um, any uh, accretions in the case of uh, navigable or title to the, the bed of the adjacent water uh, in non-navigable. There are a few exceptions in the law to that. Uh, the first one's interesting but pretty rare. Um, the second one is a little more interesting, at least for me and uh, some of the people in the audience, and that is, as I mentioned, the state received title to the navigable bodies of water in the Enabling Act. That's, that same act also made significant grants of land to the state um, and, and the other three states that came in at the same time. Uh, most, most of it, or uh, the biggest chunk for were section 16 and 36 for uh, support of the common schools, quote unquote, or elementary and secondary education. Um, if the section 16 included a um, 
a meandered body of water, the state was able to t select other lands in lieu of the lands that were underwater. I guess the theory was, well, two. One, technically the lake then was unsurveyed public lands, uh, but as a practical matter, it also meant that the lake probably didn't have economic value at that time uh, for leasing or sale, so the purpose of the law was to give uh, that value to the state to help it get started in uh, education, et cetera. So the state could select other lands. Uh, in this example, you will see, um, uh, I didn't bold, I should have bold the section lines, but the, the uh, north line of section 16 is, on, you can see has the word west on it, and then the west line uh, runs through a non-meandered lake up at the top along the, uh, and then along the, the west edge of the, the lake itself. So what happened, or I, in theory, would have happened here, again, this is a hypothetical, I don't know, I did not look to be sure exactly what happened here, but most likely what you would find is that the state would have selected, if you take 640 minus 546.50, which is, is uh, the surveyed acreage in the section, they would have gotten 93.5 acres somewhere else to make up for the fact that they didn't get lake bed in this section 16. Um, but that means they didn't get the lake bed. So who owns it? Um, well, back to what we said a, a bit ago, or I skipped by the slide, but the federal government is free to either convey or not, and if it doesn't, the federal government keeps it. So you can end up with the interesting situation of the federal government owning some lake bed or non-navigable riverbed um, where it does not own any riparian land. Um, and uh, the other thing, when I put this up and started looking at it, I could come up with some really interesting questions as to line drawing, given that the acreage in lieu was a specific amount, but you don't draw the lines uh, exactly that way. And I won't uh, jump on David's topic any more than that. But uh, the issue of uh, description this could have been back with the deeds, but uh, we see in leases uh, the same thing. And I think there are some unique issues here. This is an area that I'm aware of at least one case that has been uh, appealed and has been argued. So it's uh, just, we should have a decision uh, at some point on this uh, issue of uh, what, what did you lease when you described lots uh, and uh, didn't, think about or didn't talk about specifically adjacent lake bed. Uh, I think, you know, there are a number of arguments. I think perhaps one that might be most significant would be if it is very, very, very clear that you were paying bonus based on a net acre basis. Uh, you know, there can, how that's clear and how you get out of the language of a contract into extraneous evidence, if you need to do that uh, is another issue. Uh, but, but that certainly is, is one of the things that, that, that could make a difference. So now we know um, that it, who, uh, the navigable or not, who owns it. We know uh, generally that your, your boundary goes to the, the edge or the center. The big question today, the second one here, but the big question in the world today, or the real world of uh, the business is, uh, relates to navigable, and that is um, who owns, or where, where does the river start and the upland end for ownership purposes? And the reason uh, there's an issue is because it's clear that under the Enabling Act, the state acquired from high water mark to high water mark on both sides. However, there was a statute in Dakota Territory law that was in the, carried over into the uh, state law uh, when North Dakota adopted the Constitution and became a state that says, uh, except when it says otherwise, the riparian owner takes to the low water mark. So is it high or low? Um, historically, um, the state has taken the position that it owns at least as to oil and gas 
the minerals to the high water mark and it has leased that way. Um, when I was there and before that, we uh, used aerial photos um, and occasionally an on the ground survey if there was production and there needed to be a stipulation or something, but generally aerial photos um, from the uh, Missouri or from the Highway 85 bridge uh, southwest of Williston, uh, west to the Montana line. Um, we'd use current aerial photos um, and then from there east because it was uh, considered to be part of the uh, reservoir, we, we were using uh, photos taken about the time or after, shortly after the Garrison Dam was, was closed in, in 1951. Um, several years ago, um, with the Commissioner Pressler, who's in the audience, decided it was a good idea to figure out, get, you know, now that this stuff is really valuable, maybe we should get something better than, you know, notwithstanding Dr. Brand and his people's excellent analysis of the maps in-house, that uh, we'd get some people to go out there and survey uh, from uh, on the western edge, where it was clearly a river on the ground, and then do their analysis of the, uh, um, the, the photos that were available um, for the uh, river under the reservoir. And um, so that is what is being used now. And uh, there is a, I don't have it here, but there's a, in David's presentation a, a website address or basically go to the Department of Trust Lands. There's a, a lot of very interesting stuff there. Uh, the, the results of the, or, or the reports prepared by the uh, engineering firm uh, some definitions and information on how you define ordinary high water mark, how it's determined, um, and uh, we won't uh, go into that anymore right now. But so, um, why is it still an issue? Well, the latest statement of the Supreme Court was in a uh, the Sprinsonatic versus Mills case decided in 1990. 94, um, they looked at the statute, they looked at the Enabling Act, et cetera, the Constitution. They said the meaning of takes is unclear. And they said everybody, own, or both sides, both the state and the upland owner owns something. It's complicated. We don't have to give you the details as to who owns what now, so we won't. And uh, so now, uh, a little less than 20 years later, we're, uh, we're gonna get the details, at least as to the oil and gas ownership. Uh, this is just an aside. Uh, I, uh, this was the Mills case involved uh, land below the dam. Uh, it'd be interesting to speculate if this, were, this language were applied to the, uh, the land on the other side of the dam, which don't anybody get too excited, I think, for a lot of reasons not least of which might be political, that probably isn't gonna happen, at least not in the most extreme sense. But here again, this is just my fiction and uh, I don't wanna say anything that anybody else in the audience might disagree with. Um, so I guess the question some of you might be asking was, well, what's the big deal? Well, here's a photo from the, um, study of the uh, an area east of Williston and you can see the red line is where the state has determined the ordinary high water mark is. The white is what at least to my untrained eye would be what is clearly water. Beyond that um, I'll just say very briefly and if you want to know uh, as I mentioned uh, Mike Brand, Dr. Brand is in the audience. He's uh, the person I learned anything I know about uh, this uh, you, you talk about soil types, you talk about vegetation um, to determine, obviously, it isn't just where the water is today. If it's the ordinary high water mark, it's, it, it goes out to the point at which uh, the effects of the water are clear on the land. Uh, so there's a pretty good chunk of land in there that if you looked at ordinary high versus low, um, and even defining low would be an issue, but there's a, a, an awful lot of land worth thousands and thousands of dollars a mineral acre just in this slide. 
Um, here's an example from where they did the on-the-ground survey, and this is an aerial photo, uh, a current one, rel over which has, they have overlain the, uh, the actual survey results. And again, this isn't quite as dramatic, but you can see some things inside the red line that to me, uh, with all deference to others, look like they might be trees, uh, but the kind of trees they are matter. And uh, <laughs> uh, again, but there could, certainly if it's low water, that could be an issue. So um, there's been uncertainty. There's been double leasing, uh, which isn't uncommon in the business. Uh, there's been money in suspense. There's been title opinions with lots of uh, CYA and let's pick a number because it works uh, kinds of analysis. Um, but we should have the answer soon. Now, of course, soon is in quotes in reference to the earlier slide on the Little Missouri. But uh, thankfully, in this case, the parties wanted to get it involved. And thanks to uh, uh, Judge Nelson um, and the, the lawyers involved in a couple cases, the, we had a consolidation of two cases and focused only on the first question, which is who owns the shore zone. Uh, there were cross motions uh, for summary judgment in that case filed, and uh, the next few slides are my uh, attempt to summarize the arguments, and it is, uh, it, it is a very complex uh, issue, I think. I mentioned to Judge Nelson after uh, he had decided the motion that I was going to be talking about this, and I was going to look at the briefs to see if I could understand the arguments, and his response was, well, you better just read one, because if you read one, you're going to think they're right, and then you read the other one, you're going to think they're right. And I, I have to agree with him on that. Uh, it's, it's a complex situation. The Mills case, I don't think, is clear, and uh, the briefs are very well written, and that, those are available to lawyers on the, uh, the court site uh, directly to get in. Otherwise, you could get them from the uh, clerk of court if, if you'd want them. Um, so my attempt really briefly to summarize, the state says statute that supposedly gives it away really isn't a grant of ownership. It's a rule of construction. I had a hard time figuring out, well, what does that mean? Uh, until I, I put it in, uh, well, what they said is that the, 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 you look at the statute, the initial clause says, except when the grant under which the land is held indicates a different intent, the riparian owner takes to the low water mark. What the state is saying is it doesn't make sense to interpret that as a conveyance to the low water mark. The, the way I think of it, I had to finally think of it as a title lawyer was, if I give you a deed to my house and I say I hereby grant and convey my house, it, it doesn't make sense for the deed to say I give you my house except when the deed says otherwise. Uh, what does make sense is to have that statute be rule of interpretation of my deed, which would mean that it's saying, when I give you a deed to my house, unless I say you don't get the yard, you do get the yard. And so uh, I think that's what that argument is. Uh, another argument is that the statute was enacted, um, I'm backtracking here, but the statute was enacted as I said, a territorial under the Dakota Code, um, or the Code of the Dakota Territory, and the territory did not have the authority to give away the land between the low and the high water mark. The territory was really the federal government, and under the Equal Footing Doctrine, they were obliged to hold it in trust for the new states. Um, and since it was carried over right away into the Constitution, or into the current laws that way, it should be interpreted the same way. There are also constitutional arguments, gift clause, et cetera, and um, a few other things. The Recrarian Ordinance basically said, Mills decided this stuff. Um, yeah, it's not 100% clear, but they basically said the riparian owner got to the low water mark, um, subject 
to an easement or subject to the public trust doctrine. The public trust doctrine is uh, use of the water, things like uh, swimming, recreation, et cetera. You don't need oil and gas two miles underground to fulfill the public trust doctrine. So you didn't get it, or I mean, you didn't keep it. Um, it, it went under the, uh, the conveyance or under the statute. Um, I won't get into, they also um, respond to the territorial version basically by saying that yes, it was a rule of construction, but when the state became a state, it had a choice. Uh, do we go low or do we go high? Other states uh, have gone either way, and that by carrying over that statute into the uh, code in North, once the state uh, became a state, uh, the state had made that choice to the low water mark. In January, Judge Nelson issued an order for partial summary judgment in favor of the state, um, and it, uh, with some uh, help from the lawyers in terms of uh, procedural matters, a final order for judgment is entered. I don't know if it's been appealed yet, but I'm sure it will be soon. And uh, I would just say that uh, one thing I have, but I'm already over, so the, uh, it gets really interesting if the federal government is the riparian landowner. And with that, we'll let David.